So let's continue our discussion of using the laws of large numbers to understand provisioning for erasure correcting codes. Basically, let's look at the same problem we were looking at before. We have k messages. We encode them into a degree k minus 1 polynomial. That turns into a code word by evaluating a polynomial at endpoints. And we transmit these endpoints as n packets that are through an erasure channel, which randomly erases certain packets, such that on average, n p are erased, and n times 1 minus p are not erased. Same problem as before, except before, we took the length of the code word n as a given, and we asked, how many messages can we safely pack into that code word? Well, now let's turn it around. Suppose it's more natural to think that we have a certain amount of messages we want to transmit, and we would like to know how long of a code word would we need to do that. You can see here, it's the same basic problem. But how do we turn it around? How does that analysis work? Well, the first thing you notice is we can actually reuse a lot of the work we've just done. So let's look here at this picture. So this is a new question, right? How big of a code word do we need? This picture still applies. There's still going to be some k, except k is now known. Now what we want to do is k is fixed, and we're going to move this entire curve around by choosing where n times 1 minus p is. But formally, these definitions still hold. The analysis done here still holds, still holds, still holds, still holds. Now, the only thing that becomes different is where do we go from here. Here, remember, for us now, k is known, but n is the unknown. So taking this path that we did last time, this path is not so helpful because it tells us epsilon, which we don't know, in terms of n, which we also don't know. It's better to take this other path. So what is this path? This path, this expression here, this comes from this. You just cross multiply and substitute in epsilon n equals n times 1 minus p minus k. So now you have this expression. And what's nice about this? What's nice is this is the unknown we want, n, in a couple of places. And the knowns, p and k, these are known. in a few places. And these n's, remember, these are unknown. But look at this expression. This is an equation which involves n and these known quantities. And what kind of an equation is it in n? Well, it's pretty easy to see. This is going to be a quadratic. So we have a quadratic equation in n. We know we can solve quadratics. So let's go ahead and do that. The first thing we're going to do is if we're going to solve this as a quadratic, it's useful to have the n you know, by itself, isolated, without this 1 minus p hanging onto it. So let's do a simple dividing through. Let's divide through by 1 minus p squared on both sides. So we'll get 100 p divided by 1 minus p times n equals n minus k over 1 minus p squared. So we have this formula. We can now apply, uh, basically get ourselves into a position where we can apply the quadratic formula. So let's expand it out. So now bring everything together onto one side. So what's the linear term here? Right. The linear term here is this and this. So let's put it as a minus 100p. Everything is over 1 minus p. And here we have a minus 2k, so this becomes a plus 2k times n. And then this term. So this is a straight up uh, quadratic. It's going to have two roots. And now the question is, what kind of roots are these going to be? Are they going to be real, or are they going to be complex? So 
First thing we notice is they're going to be real. Why are they real? They're real since if you look at the discriminant of this, what do you get? Well, you take this part here and you square it. And you subtract 4 times this times this. So you look at it. The common denominator here is going to be 1 minus p squared for both of them. And here you're going to have a 4k squared, which is going to subtract from this 4k squared, so it gets subtracted off by this 4k squared. But the resulting terms are going to be positive. And since the discriminant is positive, the roots are going to be real. So you look at this if you want to simplify it out. And this thing, since k is clearly greater than 0, p is greater than 0, p is greater than 0, this whole thing is greater than 0. So we have two real roots. So what is the what are these roots? Quadratic formula says these real roots are going to be at. So this is where the real roots are. We can actually simplify this a little bit by bringing some terms out. So notice the 1 minus p's are common, so we can take those out. We get 2, 1 minus p. This 100 p plus 2k is out here. And then we have a plus minus. Now notice in here we have basically a 100. That's very clean, clearly there. And also a 4. So if you want to, we can just take this out and say 100 times square root 4 kp plus 100 p squared. So we have this expression. But what are we to make of this expression? You know, is this, is this something where we take the negative root, the, the one with the minus sign here, the positive root? Is the negative root actually negative? You know, is it positive? Like, what's going on here? Clearly, if you use a plus sign, this whole thing is definitely going to be positive. But with the minus sign, is it positive or is it negative? It's not immediately clear, um, although it turns out it will be positive. So in such a situation, what should you do? Well, the best thing to do always is try an example. Now, which example should be used? Well, notice we've already done a calculation in the last part. So it's easiest to use the same example. It's also a reality check. You know, we should plug stuff in so we get 900 as the answer for n. So let's plug in these, this example. So when you plug in k equals 300 and p equals 1 half into this expression, what do we get? 100 times p becomes 50 plus 2k is 600, plus minus 10 square root, 4 times k times p, well 4 times p is 2, which is 2 times k is 600, 100 p squared, p squared is a quarter, 100 times a quarter is 25, which is nice because 625 has this nice square root divided by 2 times 1 minus p, which is 2 times a half, which is just 1. So this thing becomes 650 plus or minus 10 times 25, or 650 plus or minus 250. So we can see here that it's the positive root that we want. The positive root is 900. And the, when we use a negative sign here, we get 650 minus 250, which is 400. So you look at this, and how can you tell that it must, in fact, be the 900 that we want and not the 400? Well, the reason is, you look at this expression that we have here, and you say, well, the answer has got to be at least uh, 600. Why? Because n times 1 minus p is what we tip typically expect to have happen. So if you don't have at least 600 uh, in n, we know we're in trouble because 
with probability one half they're going to be deleted and we will have one half high confidence if we don't have at least 600 we're almost sure that we're going to get too few so 400 can't be the right answer and 900 is so the answer is this with the positive sign So given that this is the correct answer, let's take a look at this expression and see if we can't distill out what's the essential character of what's going on. Well, notice this 2 here. This 2 is canceling things, so maybe we should just take that cancellation into account. So the roots are at 50p plus 50p divided by 1 minus p plus k divided by 1 minus p plus square root of, let's look at this 10 here, and divide this by the 2, 5, divided by 1 minus p. And up here, what do we have? Well, we have this 4, we have this 4kp plus 100 p squared. So what are the terms that depend on k? Well, this is the dom one dominant term that depends on k, because it depends on k itself. And then we have this other term inside here. These are terms that depend on k, but as square root of k. So what it's telling you is that basically the answer is going to be k over 1 minus p plus this expression and then some other terms that have to do with the details. And the important thing is that this term also scales like square root of k. So what have we learned from this? We've learned that not only can you use the law of large numbers to figure out how much work we can get done with a certain amount of resource, we can also use it to figure out how much resource we need to get a certain amount of work done. And that's what we've done here. And it's a simple matter of solving a quadratic equation which is very easy to do. Now, having seen these examples, you should begin to appreciate that actually there's lots of things you can calculate using the laws of large numbers. Anytime you have a question which involves some random quantity which is happening over and over and over again and being combined using an addition of some kind, these kind of laws of large numbers, like Chebyshev's inequality, are useful to do calculations.